hey, hey, what's up, folks? How are you doing? This is Andrea Hedlund coming to you from the road. Uh, yes, I'm actually driving right now, as you can see. I didn't have to tell you that, right? It's pretty obvious. But I'm on my way to Sao Paulo, actually the state of Sao Paulo. And it's gonna take me a couple of hours and I just wanted to take this opportunity and record a video to thank all of you who sent me wonderful feedback on my learning Cosmos design. So I'm very, very happy. You can't imagine how incredibly I don't know, humbled I am really, honored by your feedback. A lot of people said it was wonderful, it was really, uh, I don't know, it was something that helped them change their perspective on education and uh, some people wanted to know more about the spheres within the design and I really wanted to talk more about it while I'm driving. I hope I can do both, right? Not great at multitasking. Nobody is actually. This is how the brain works, right? But since, you know, uh, I just have to talk and I can actually look uh, ahead and uh, pay attention to what's going on, I think we can do this, right? So yeah, the learning Cosmos design is something I've been working on for a couple of months now. It was really the product of my dissertation. And um, it was also something that came to my mind because of my incredible, let, let's say, you know, curiosity when it comes to the universe and how things are connected. And I wanted to use an analogy that made sense, something that could actually give educators all over the world this idea of uh, trying to learn more about different spheres that impact learning. So everything that surrounds the learner's universe, right? And it just happened to, to work, you know? It's just, I think the analogy was really great. It was um, inspired by Stephen Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time. And also Carl Sagan's Cosmos, right, TV show, and which is being remade now. Actually, there there are two uh, seasons, I think. It's a new series, and the host is Neil deGrasse Tyson, very famous astrophysicist as well from the USA. Funny guy, very intelligent. I really like him. But so the thing is, um, I wanted people to understand how complex whatever impacts learning is you know everything that is surrounding the learner beyond the cognitive level so we normally think about learning in cognitive terms like how much attention students were able to pay to to the teacher how much of the content they were able to memorize and, and reproduce right uh, their use of language and things like that but we all know we you know if we're educators and we have experience in the classroom which I believe you do right we all know that it goes beyond that it's not about just about paying attention memorizing a kind of uh, retrieving when the test comes but it's also about regulating yourself and controlling your behaviors and um, dealing with your emotions, right? And also, you know, thinking about how you can learn best and changing your attitudes and beliefs toward learning and staying motivated, right? And also it's about the infrastructure and the policy and the mindset of your institution, the school you are studying. And that's why I think it's useful to look at, at all of those spheres, all of those levels, as a cosmos, right? With different levels of analysis. Think about our solar system, for example. So right now we are on this beautiful planet, Earth, right? I'm driving on the roads of Earth right now. Beautiful green pastures and, you know, beautiful fields and uh, trees. 
lots of animals. Look at that blue sky, amazing. And that's one planet in the solar system, right? Just one. And then we have Mars, and I think a lot of people are paying attention to Mars nowadays because of uh, endurance and NASA and everything, right? And Mars has a very thin atmosphere, and uh, there's no life there, as far as we know, right? And uh, very kind of reddish, yellowish uh, landscapes, not like our planet, which is really a jewel, you know, a pale dot in the ocean of the of the universe, you know, in the vastness of the universe. I believe that that's something Carl Sagan said. But we can also look at the solar system level, like all of the planets interacting in their orbits around the sun. Uh, you have very different planets, which are composed by different types of of elements, you know, and we can actually look at them using the technology that we have nowadays and, and figure out what they're made of, right? So you look at Jupiter, which is about a thousand times bigger than our planet, but most of Jupiter is actually gas, right? So you look there, there are huge hurricanes that are happening there for thousands of years, right? Which is amazing if you think about it. But the gravitational pull by, by Jupiter is so intense that it's actually protecting us from getting bombarded by asteroids, right? So there's this huge asteroid belt between uh, Mars and Jupiter. And we can also look at other stars. So we can think of very distant stars or closer stars and we can think of whether they, they have planets or not right so our star the Sun which is uh, you know shining brightly today with a beautiful day actually is not even that big if you think about other stars in the universe in our in our galaxy even right the ones that we can see so this one is actually just a yellow, it's not a red giant star, or... So all of those elements are incredibly, I think, fascinating, really. And that's the thing, that's the analogy, the learning cosmos, right? We can focus on different level of, levels of analysis, and we can understand what's going on there. So, basically what I meant really is that our students they should be the core of the planet the self that's the very first circle so the self the core of the planet and i was actually inspired by uri Bronfenbrenner's um, ecological systems theory right which makes a lot of sense also because there are concentric circles uh different levels of influence and we, if you look at the self, at, at the individual, this idea of, of you know, uh, identity, for example, has a lot to do with the core of the planet, the heart of the planet, right? And then, surrounding the self, still on the planet, the planetary level, right? We have a couple of spheres of influence, and the very first sphere of influence is the cognitive sphere because I think that's what we talk about more and more nowadays isn't it I mean that's the basically what we've been talking about for many many years nowadays of course there was a shift I think to emotions basically we've been talking about other skills we call them soft skills right but I think it's really all about cognition in most educational settings. It's how much you can pay attention to something and how much you can remember later. So, uh, and summative assessment, tests, exams, right? Grades and everything. So then that's one that the, the most immediate sphere of influence because of the way our educational system is set up. And then the next sphere of influence is the emotional sphere. And the emotional sphere 
would be so I uh, you know going back to the cognitive sphere because I forgot to say that it would be the cognitive sphere would be like the conditions of this planet to sustain life and if you think about it I think two of the most important conditions are that we have drinkable water in li in the liquid state right and uh, we also have breathable air so that those two things are very important so that's the cognitive sphere equivalent to the cognitive sphere right and then if you go to the next sphere which is the emotional sphere so that would be kind of like our I'd say climate you know and um, and our mood would be like the weather so like it's sunny now kind of chilly so that's the weather good weather today and then moving past the, the emotional sphere we get to the attitudes and beliefs sphere and this sphere is very important because it tells us why our students act a certain way when it comes to learning whether they stick to uh, you know the task day in day out or if they give up easily or if they get frustrated or if they they believe that they cannot learn well they don't have the talent right or the genes to accomplish something so that's the attitudes and beliefs here and then uh, so and, and this is very interesting if we so we are comparing to the universe the cosmos right that's the analogy so the attitudes and beliefs sphere has a lot to do with our attitudes and beliefs about how physics works and how science works really the scientific um, thinking of the time so if you don't have the proper beliefs you are probably going to believe things that don't make sense from a scientific perspective or things that we do not have empirical evidence to support them right and I gave two examples in the text I talked about the notion of a flat earth right so if you don't have the right attitude or beliefs especially beliefs right about how physics works then you might believe that we are on a flat earth right now which we are not by the way you know and also astrology so we I know a lot of people use astrology to guide themselves and uh, it's actually fun if you think about it but there's no empirical evidence to support that the position of stars and planets you know in the cosmos has anything to do with our lives here on this planet right there have been a couple of studies meta-analysis even and there's no relation right so they're not scientific and you know sometimes we don't have to be scientific I'm not saying anything here but I do think we have to be more and more scientific hopefully let me drink some coffee while I think okay so <laughs> Yes, I brought my coffee here. Yeah, and, and, and then attitudes and beliefs, very important. They are basically the scientific thinking of the time. Oh, it's still hot. See, it's a thermos, right? Physics can explain why it's still hot, right? And then the other sphere, the next one, is really about uh, motivation. So, it means that you are able to actually be engaged long term in the classroom and uh, make adjustments and, and, and find reasons to be there to learn to want to learn right and I think this has a lot to do with the atmosphere of our planet because uh, and, and uh, I like this analogy because really the atmosphere is the ambient right it's it's the environment in a way your immediate surrounding right there where you are and I like the idea of, of using uh, the atmosphere for this particular analogy because I think the atmosphere is influenced not only 
by what's going on uh, on the inside of the planet, right? On the planet, but also on the outside of the planet as well. Uh, so, which means that us, you know, teachers, let's say, since we're talking about our learners, we can influence their motivation, right? We can help them be more motivated, okay? And then we're moving away from the self, we're leaving the planetary level, right? And we're getting to the solar system level. So the solar system level is within the macrocosm, right? If you think about physics, the macrocosm is what studies the large, the physics of the large, right? So you look at other planets and you look at uh, even galaxies, right? So on the solar system level, we should look at, especially, I think, the learning design. And this is really where teachers can shine, you know, to use the sun as a reference here. Because we are responsible for designing our lessons, aren't we? And uh, when we do that effectively, of course, our students are going to learn more effectively. And we have a lot of say in the design of our lessons, even when we give our students more autonomy and protagonism, right? Because we can design the lessons to be like that. We can work with the idea of active learning methods and um, flexible learning environments. But we also should look at uh, something that Robert Bjork, Little and Bjork and Bjork, you know, uh, Elizabeth Bjork, as I think that's her name, Liz Bjork, right? Robert Bjork's wife. They've uh, been discussing for a while. It's called Desirable Difficulties, right? And Desirable Difficulties is how you design the activities, not just what goes on, but really the, the activities and when, for example, when students are going to see those activities again, so that spacing, uh, how students are going to bring, you know, the, the content from the activity back to their working memory, so that's retrieving, and how students are going to sequence things, so that's interleaving, mixing different activities or different modalities of activities, right? So they are just, and of course, where and, and how students are going to work with the output of those activities, so that's variation. So they are called desirable difficulties, right? We can design our lessons around or, you know, based on those uh, ideas by Bjork. And then finally, so that's, you know, the uh, solar system level. And then we get to the, I call it the interstellar level because it's beyond the influence of our sun. Uh, the heliosphere, right? Is it heli helium? Heliosphere. See, I don't remember the name, but I think that's it. I have to work on my physics as well. And um, you're moving away from Pluto, you know, which is not really a planet anymore, but you're getting out there uh, looking for other stars, you know. And uh, when you're on the interstellar level, it's really about the environment and the context, really. So that is more related to an institutional level uh, that maybe we don't have a lot of say, I mean, in terms of what we can do and change, you know, because it comes from a very sort of a top-down relationship, you know, that the school tells us what to do and they have their beliefs, they have their mindset and their policy, not just the school, it comes from... Um, really policy, right, legislation, what can be done in education or not. So many countries, I, I believe most countries have laws about what education should be like, what should be in their educational system. So that's the interstellar level, really, the context, the resources that we have in the classroom as well, in the, at the school as a whole. So... And it, it gets further away from us as educators and from the students, the self, the individual, right? And that's really the learning cosmos design, folks, yes. I was talking about the levels and I think really my idea was to help you find, th 
theories to study, to get familiar with, really. Because, you know, I looked at all of the theories or many of the theories that I, I studied as a psychology of uh, education student at the University of Bristol. See, I was there. <laughs> and, um, and I felt like most educators, or not just educators really, but anyone in the school ecosystem, they should learn, they should know what those things are about. So not just attention and memory, how they work, engagement as well, how we build new knowledge. So that came from Paul Howard Jones, my professor, uh, a professor from Collège de France, Stanislas, right? Uh, the four pillars of learning that's on the cognitive level or the cognitive sphere. And then when you move on to the, the emotional sphere, I think we should learn more about emotional intelligence, which was popularized by um, Daniel Goleman, right? Also, emotion regulation, Gross and Thompson, uh, Stuart, Stuart Schenker as well, self-regulation. And then we also have the theory of constructed emotion by Lisa Barrett, right? So Lisa Feldman Barrett, uh, great book, 2017. So you should really know about those things. And then if you move on to the next sphere, the attitudes and beliefs sphere, you need to know more about mindsets, you know, Carol Dweck and Grit, Angela Lee Duckworth, and you know, you should definitely know more about metacognition, learning how to learn. John Flavel, right? The original, the guy who, who, who put the idea forth, I guess, you know, in the 1970s, right? You should also know more about self-efficacy by uh, Albert Bandura. So the different sources of self-efficacy, how to help our students be more self-efficacious, you know? And I think really, it's uh, knowing about those theories, knowing how to apply certain principles, right? And then when you get to the motivational, motivational sphere, the atmosphere of our planet, it's more about uh, Daniel Pink, wh who talks about uh, autonomy, mastery, and purpose for intrinsic motivation. And intrinsic motivation comes from uh, DC, uh, Edward DC and Ryan, right? Ryan DC, yeah, Richard Ryan, exactly. So Edward DC and Richard Ryan, if I'm not mistaken. So intrinsic motivation, and they talk about autonomy as well, competence and relatedness, or a sense of um, connection or belonging, right? So we should know more about those things. And finally, as as you're getting to the learning design. The, the solar system part, right, or level, you should know more, like I said, desirable difficulties, definitely, but you should get inspired by so many authors, so many sources from all over the place, really, like uh, Maria Montessori, let's say, and Loris Malaguzzi with the idea of uh, constructivist pedagogies, right, and then and really active learning and, and uh, protagonism and everything. Uh, you should also get inspired by anyone working with project-based learning, right? Go back to the source, like John Dewey. You get inspired by Paulo Freire as well, critical pedagogy, right? And uh, really differentiation and individualization and personalization. All of those things, they are part of, of this sphere. How we can make our students more autonomous and how we can actually make sure that we are, be, we're, you know, in a way catering, let's say, uh, for their needs, right? Because they are all different. They come from different backgrounds and we have to have different learning designs for different students as well. So, or we have to have a, an open learning design that will allow, allow the differences to flourish. That's the idea, right? So that's it, folks, I think. That's the learning cosmos design. It was really something that gave me a lot of joy, really, when I was working with the idea and, and trying to come up with something that made sense, that was um, 
easy to understand even though it was really complex, right? If you think about all of those theories surrounding learning and, and the learner uh, themselves, it's really, really a lot of things. We have to learn a lot of things, right? Yeah, but I feel like at the same time, it was really good that I was able to put all of those theories together in this design that kind of makes sense. I think it really makes sense. I really hope that you feel the same. So please give me feedback. This is something I will be working on for probably the rest of my life, you know. I think this is gonna be my baby uh, to the world, really. Uh, you know, I really want uh, schools, school managers, families, teachers, educators all over the world looking at the learning cosmos in awe of all the beautiful and intricate uh, complexity that learning is, right? And uh, getting inspired really by the design and trying to learn more about those theories so that you can help your learners learn more effectively. So that's the dream, right? So that's it, folks. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm gonna stop now because I really have to drive faster and because of this uh, little improvised video, I think I'm driving kind of slow right now. So thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Read the Learning Cosmos, New Routes magazine. Just go to newroutes.com.br, maybe, I'm not sure. Just Google Learning Cosmos, Andrea Hedlund, New Routes, and you're gonna find the text. I'd love your feedback. And share with your friends, share with people who might benefit from this, okay? Bye-bye, everyone, and we'll keep talking.